But if I've got you, then why don't I still have enough? you then why don't I still have enough in the mountains and called on you Good morning, happy Friday. Welcome to campus worship and happy homecoming family weekend uh, week. A lot of great activities going on uh, tomorrow uh, with a lot of athletic events and opportunity to meet and greet faculty. So hope you'll take advantage of that opportunity and uh, hope to see some of your parents here uh, tomorrow. Uh, reminder that Trojan Transit will be here to pick up if you need uh, transportation following worship. Don't forget the campus worship code. If you need any assistance with that, don't hesitate to see one of the campus worship greeters. I uh, want to remind you of the different mission trip opportunities that our office is sponsoring uh, during March and also at the end of the spring semester. We're going to be going to Panama City Beach, to Kentucky, to Southeast Asia, and also to England. And uh, there was an email that was sent out a few weeks ago. You can refer to that or you can see a member of our team and we'll be glad to talk with you more about those opportunities. Also on October the 30th, I mentioned this on Wednesday, from four to eight in the Vandiver Gallery, the AU chapter of the International Justice Mission is going to be sponsoring Threads, which is a pop-up thrift store uh, to end slavery. And so they're still accepting donations of clothes and shoes and accessories, but if you want to shop, uh, you can be at Vandiver Gallery uh, between the times of 4 and 8 p.m. on October the 30th. And then finally, as an announcement, if you are interested in passion and you're not going with your college ministry from your church uh, and we're just seeing if there's interest, you can email me and let me know if you're interested in that and we'll see if there's a group uh, from AU that we would uh, be taking. Prompt question, what is your favorite holiday? You have 30 seconds to talk to your neighbor about what your favorite holiday is. A lot of chatter about the favorite holiday today. That was great. Today we welcome Dr. Channing Chrysler to campus worship. Uh, Dr. Chrysler is Associate Professor of New Testament and Biblical Greek here at AU. 
He's married to Kelly, and together they have five children, Silas, Taylor, Titus, Annalie, and Cross. And I think Silas is a student here. Is that right? Titus, I'm sorry. Titus, so it's the middle one is there. Okay, is a, is a student here. Thank you for correcting me on that. Fun fact about uh, Dr. Chrysler. Now, I'm not sure what this says about his theology, but last fall when I was new here to, to AU, a student came up to me and wanted to know if I had scheduled Dr. Chrysler. And I was not responsible for scheduling campus worship last fall, but they told me that they were convinced that Dr. Chrysler was the Apostle Paul reincarnated. So, uh, <laughs> actually, uh, in, in all seriousness, um, in addition to being a prolific author, he has, author, uh, has written more than eight books, including a three-volume commentary on Romans. But in addition to that, Dr. Chrysler enjoys rap music, and some would even consider him to be an authority on the history of, of rap music. So that's a pretty interesting fact. But Dr. Chrysler, we're so glad uh, that you're here in campus worship, and it's been an, an honor and a joy for me to get to know you in my short time here at AU. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity just to pause to reflect on who you are, to reflect on your goodness. We thank you that this time is set aside during the course of our week where we can just gather as a community of faith and learning here at Anderson University and focus our attention on you. Because you are great and greatly to be praised. So we offer you this time of worship. I know that during this point in the semester that students are tired they're weary it seems as though things are starting to pile up and in addition to the assignments that they have there's numerous other demands on their time and perhaps they're dealing with things related to family issues back home but I pray that this morning we would just cast all of our care all of our anxiety on you and recognize that you care for us so we offer our worship to you this morning, both through song and through the hearing and the preaching of your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Y'all stand in worship with us. Okay. 
held down. That power is living in us now. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. We sing Christ and Christ crucified in you. We're raised from death to life. We sing Christ and Christ crucified. Hallelujah. to worship him and praise him for he overcame death he overcame hell he overcame sin and shame what a powerful name is the name that is Jesus let us continue to just worship him and praise him for who he is
out there was a moment there was a moment when the sky lit up a flash of light breaking through thank you God when all was lost he crossed eternity for me and you the king of life was on the moon Thank you, and we worship you for who you are. You are so worthy of all the praise, of all the honor, and all the glory that we can possibly bring. Lord, we give you our lives today. We give you all of our worship and our love, Lord. We lavish it upon you. God, you overcame the world, you overcame death and the grave, you overcame our sin and shame, and we thank you for that, Lord. 
We thank you that there is no other name that is mighty enough to do that, that is powerful enough to do that. Lord, we love you and we worship you and we thank you for the mighty name of Jesus. In your holy and precious name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Good morning, everybody. Just want to let everybody know that uh, I brought my shoes so I would have them. It's for my wife. It's a pickup line in college. So I got my first date with her because I used to have more hair and more game. Yes. <laughs> I think everybody knows why I am here this morning. And that is to give you an update on what is quickly becoming the greatest love story of our time. And I, of course, am talking about Travis Kelsey <laughs> and Taylor Swift. <laughs> now, I almost always never look at People magazine. But in preparation for today, I wanted to let you know what their week had been like. On Monday, after the Chiefs played the Chargers, which I believe they were victorious, Travis and Taylor uh, traveled in Kelsey's Royals Royce, and they ate at Piripos, which is an Argentine steakhouse. And afterwards, they were seen walking hand in hand. And uh, listen to this, Travis even opened the door for her. Okay. Now, the article went on to say that Taylor is now worth around somewhere north of $740 million. She actually just purchased an island for $17 million. Very, very relatable. <laughs> and um, if I've offended Swifties today, what I would like to say is this is me trying. And I see your ricochet of tears. And I would invite you to take your cardigan and pull it real tight. And together, we're going to make it through. Amen? Amen. All right. That's it for today. We're going to pray. And um, the Lord's been among us. Amen? If you have your Bibles, if you would take them or scroll to them. And Galatians, we're going to look this morning just for a few minutes at Galatians, Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Galatians chapter 3, verses 1 through 5. Hear the word of the Lord through his apostle Paul. O foolish Galatians! Who has bewitched you, before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? This only I want to learn from you. Did you receive the Spirit from the works of the law or from the hearing of faith? In this way you are foolish, having begun by the Spirit are you now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Therefore, the one who supplies the Spirit to you and works powers in you, is it from the works of the law or from the hearing of faith? My message this morning is quite simple. 
and it comes from the heart. When you leave this place and someone asks you what the chapel message was about, I don't know if students do that kind of thing. It's really just one phrase. Finish like you started. Finish like you started. That is Paul's admonition of the Galatians, that in the Christian life, in the Christian experience, in Christian faith, in following a crucified and risen Jesus, we must finish in the same way that we started. There's something that happens to all of us as believers, somewhere between the beginning and the end. The road is long, it's winding, it's filled with triumphs and trials and tribulations. And somewhere between the beginning and the end of this walk with Christ, somewhere in that interim period, if we're not careful, we'll try to finish the race in a different way from which we began. And I want to admonish all of us this morning, whether you consider yourself a Christian or not, I want you to hear me carefully, this message from the heart that we must finish in the way that we started. What happens between those two poles to us as believers? Well, one of the things that happens to us is what was happening to the Galatians. And that is that they are enticed by false teaching. Paul had spent a lot of time in Galatia. He had poured a lot of sweat and blood and indeed tears into preaching the gospel of the crucified and risen Jesus of the Galatians. And as soon as he left, false teachers came in and told the Galatians that Paul only told you part of the gospel. If you really want to share in the blessings of God, if you really want to be redeemed by, by God for all eternity, then you've got to do something different than the way Paul told you to start. It became not faith, which is where the Galatians started, but faith and works. Particularly here, Paul mentions works of the law. These false teachers apparently told these Christians in Galatia, if you want to really, if you want to lean into God, you must live like a Jew. You must do the external things that a Jew does. And Paul writes to the Galatians, and here's what he has to say about those false teachers. Let them be accursed. Let them be eternally condemned. You must finish in the way that you started. And the way the Galatians started and the way that you and I start the Christian life is by faith and faith alone. Faith in a crucified Christ. Look at what Paul says in Galatians 3.1. You are foolish, Galatians, who has bewitched you. Now, where there was this belief in the ancient world that you could look at someone. It was called the evil eye. Maybe that eye that your parents gave you when you did something you shouldn't have. This was much worse. It could literally cast a spell upon you and the forces of fate would direct your life. And Paul uses this metaphorically. And he says, you're trying to finish in a different way that you started. You started by faith. You're trying to finish by works. Who has cast a theological spell upon you? And he brings their minds back to the way that they started. Paul takes them back to what he preached to them. And Paul only had one message. He was not a very talented preacher. It was the same message over and over and over and over again. If he was a politician, he would have never been elected. He had one stump speech and one stump speech only. And it was to declare that Jesus Christ was crucified for sinners like you and me. 
Now, there are crosses on this campus. There are crosses on our jewelry. And there's no shame in that, but there was shame in the first century. A cross was an instrument of shame and torture and pure evil and punishment. Paul says Jesus Christ was portrayed to you publicly as crucified. That means Jesus hung upon that cross unclothed for all the world to see, bearing our shame, bearing our guilt, absorbing the very wrath of God that sinners deserve. And how does one experience that grace of Jesus standing in my place and standing in your place? Paul says you began by faith, don't try to finish by works. And what happens between these two poles is sometimes false teaching. One that says, lean in to all these very godly, seemingly godly acts that will make you right with God. You really want to be blessed by God. Do all of these things. Make the list. Cross them off one by one. And Paul says you can't finish that way. You have to finish the way you started, by faith alone, finish by faith alone, from faith to faith. And what happens between those two poles, the beginning and the end? What happens to us? Sometimes it's a false gospel. On one side of the ledger, that false gospel will say, lean into these works, sweat it out. And on the other side, it's the same extreme erroneous thought and that is Jesus paid it all so I can do it all if salvation is by grace through faith alone if eternal redemption is a pure gift of God that I start by faith and I finish by faith why does it really matter what I do with my life in between if as Paul told the Romans that where sin increased grace abounded all the more why should I not just go on living in sin? Why not do it and ask for forgiveness later? This is a very, very dangerous game to play. And it's no game. It's a false gospel. Paul told those Romans, listen, you who died to sin, how can you still live in it? To truly start with Christ by faith, you see, is to die to sin. What happens to us between these two poles is these false gospels that creep into us. Maybe we hear them. Maybe we, maybe we concoct them in our own sort of minds. Maybe we just slowly ebb away and get there. But make no mistake about it, what happened to the Galatians can happen to us. And we must finish like we started by faith in a crucified Christ. To trust in a crucified and risen Jesus, indeed, is to trust in his grace and in his grace alone. But it is not to presume upon his grace. It is not to assume that we can live in sin. If you and I think that, we have not yet begun We've not yet embraced the truth of the gospel. Notice that Paul says, this is what I want to learn from you, verse 2. Did you receive the Spirit from the works of the law or from the hearing of faith? Paul reminds us that when we come to faith in Christ, we receive the Spirit. And the Spirit is the one who guides us between the beginning and the end, steering us in the direction of the truth of the gospel. Listen, there is nothing more Spirit-filled in all the world than a Spirit who continually points you to a crucified Christ. Don't let anyone fool you. To be Spirit-filled is to be filled with the gospel of Jesus Christ, crucified and risen for you. It is that simple. Jesus tells his apostles in the last moments before he's arrested in that last week of his life, he explains the work of the Spirit. And the Spirit is meant to shine a spotlight only upon a crucified and risen Christ. 
And Paul says, how did you receive that spirit that gets you from point A to point Z? Was it by what you did or by what you heard? It's by the hearing of faith. When you hear the gospel, you may not realize it. You may think this is just one more sort of old, crusty, bald man telling me about Jesus. But don't let looks fool you, friend. This is God saying to your heart, do you hear what this man is saying? Do you hear what he's saying? I'm giving to you faith in a crucified and risen Christ if you would just but take hold of this word. That's how one receives the Spirit. That's how one is redeemed. Not by their moral, moral sweat, but by the, by the work of God's Spirit and by faith in the gospel. Paul says, in this way you are fools. Having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Now, Paul likes to use that word a lot, flesh. He uses it in different ways. Oftentimes, he sort of plays on the word. He's sort of like a a dad with bad pun jokes here. And what he's suggesting to you is that your material body is neutral. It's weak and it's vulnerable, but in and itself is not evil. But this, you see, this is where sin and death operates. And sin and death, you see, those powers sometimes tell us you need to finish in a different way that you started. And Paul says, no. You started by faith, finish by faith. What happens to us between the beginning and the end? What happens to us? I'll tell you one thing that happens to us that can prevent us from finishing the way that we started. It's what we suffer. Notice what Paul says in verse 4. Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it was in vain? Paul says, think back to what you've endured because you trust in Christ. And if you try to finish in a different way than you started, all of those afflictions that you endured would have been for nothing. Now, I was brought up to believe that unless unless someone physically assaulted you because you were a believer, then you didn't really suffer. How often have I heard? How often have I heard? In fact, raise your hand if you ever heard this. God never gives you more than you can handle. Raise your hand if you've ever heard that. Here's what I, this, listen, uh, Tracy mentioned that I've wrote wrote a few books. Listen, here's what I want to say most eloquently as I can about the idea that God never gives you more than you can handle. Make sure you write this down. That's what I think about it. I can't, got it. I don't have a footnote for that, but that's how I feel about it. Yes? <laughs> it's simply not true. That, that misconception comes from a mistranslation and mis, misinterpretation, really, of 1 Corinthians 10, 13. That when you are tempted, God will not give you more than you can bear. But as for everything else... Let me just go through the list of things that you and I cannot bear. Number one, the power and guilt of sin. We cannot do anything about the power and guilt of sin. And I mean power and guilt of sin. The Bible describes sin as both a power that we are dead because of and something that we are guilty of. That means that every person in this room is both guilty of sin and afflicted by sin. That is more than we can handle. Agreed? What about death? Here's a statistic for you. Ten out of ten people die. Did you know that? Turn to the person on your right and say, you're going to die. And turn to the person on your left and say, you're going to die. We're all dead. But hey, good news, God never 
never gives you more than you can handle. None of us in the room can do anything about death. And who's in charge of death? Who's the God of the living and the dead? Well, it's God. It is Jesus. Jesus is always the answer. There's a rule in my class. It goes something like this. Jesus, Paul, Luther, the office. Amen? <laughs> it's one of those four. You and I and ourselves, left to ourselves, that's more than we can handle. We can't handle death. We also cannot handle Satan. There's only one person in the history of the world. Think about that. There's only one person in the history of the world who has withstood temptation by Satan. The rest of us, apart from Christ, well, listen, he is more than we can handle. And what about God's wrath? Who can handle God's wrath? Do you know that Paul describes the world as living currently under God's wrath? I know the sun is out today, and it's a nice morning, and it's homecoming week, and I'm glad for all of that, but let us not forget, we're under God's wrath in this world. Thankfully, he's gracious, and he's loving, and he continues to give us air to breathe and food to eat and water to drink. But make no mistake about it, we're under God's wrath. And you don't have to look for that wrath just in natural disasters or in horrific wars or horrific mass shootings. No, no, no. Paul tells us you can see wrath within. Because God's, the way that God really reveals his wrath is he hands you and me over to sin. If you're under the delusion this morning that you're doing things your way and you're going to live life however you want to live them, what I want to tell you is you're under God's wrath. The more you lean into sin, the more you're leaning into his wrath. And there is nothing that we can do about it apart from Jesus Christ. And then all of this, listen, this is the one that has kept me up the most at night. I've cited chapel service before. You should pray for my wife. And here's why. There was a time when before we would go to bed and I would turn out the light, this is what I would tell her. We are one day closer to death. Right? One day closer. And there's nothing we can do about it. And what really, 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 really bugs me about it is this. It's the divine mystery behind all of it. Why is the road between point A and point B so long and winding and filled with afflictions? I don't have a whole answer, but I have a partial answer. And that's because... Between the start and the finish, the gift of God in Christ is best given in suffering. That's what Paul learned. Paul had that famed thorn in his flesh he tells the Corinthians about. Three times he asked God to remove that thorn. You know what Jesus said to him? No. No. And here's why, Paul, because my power is perfected in weakness. From the beginning to the end, part of the answer, the rest of it I can't account for, but part of the answer of why it's so difficult to get from point A to point Z, from beginning to end, from the start to the finish, is because what God gives us in Christ is best given in what we suffer. Paul learned that. The Galatians were starting to learn that. And he tells them, listen, if you try to finish in a way that you didn't start by, which is by faith and faith alone, everything that you've endured in the name of Christ up to this point, it is all meaningless. I have some friends, I have some precious friends through the years 
who if faith was like a road, they've decided it's better to just be detoured in a bar ditch. Because the mystery of it all was too much for them to handle. When you have children die, when you can never quite find that path in your career, when your marriage is not what you thought it would be, you just name it. People end up in that ditch. And then they try to dig their way out of that ditch in a different way from how they started. Maybe I haven't prayed enough. Maybe I've not read my Bible enough. Maybe I've not gone to church enough. Or you know what? Maybe, maybe I should just lean into what the rest of the world does. They seem to be having a good time. There's dangers on both sides of that road, friend. You started by faith. You have to finish by faith. Notice what Paul says in verse 5. Therefore, the one who supplies the Spirit to you and works powers in you, is it from the works of the law or is it from the hearing of faith? Notice the one who supplies continually the very Spirit of God who bears witness to Christ, who makes you right with God. Why did God give that Spirit? Not by what you did, but what, what you heard the public proclamation of Jesus dying in your place, being raised from the dead, and through faith in him being made eternally right with God. Finish like you started. Do you know what a starter jacket is? <laughs> Dr. Noble probably knows what a starter jacket is. We're about the same age. When I was in college, I had a Miami Heat starter jacket. It was really cool. I thought it looked just like Run DMC, yes? And I would sit in a chapel, kind of like this one, with my headphones on, listening to Tupac the whole time. And they'd roll up the usual suspects week after week after week after week. Jesus loves you. God loves you. Jesus died for you. I'm just back there rolling through Tupac. There's probably some of you in here this morning that, listen, if truth be told, you're here for different reasons. You're not here because it's a Christian university or because you want to be closer to Jesus. I get that. I can feel that. I was there once. I was there once. I was there once. If I could ask myself one question in that auditorium, and I'll ask it to you now, if that's you, I'd just ask you why. Why you don't want to start on this road with Jesus? Maybe you think about it and you think, it just sounds a little hokey. It sounds a little foolish. You're going to tell me that a Jewish carpenter from Nazareth came down from heaven and he died on a Roman cross and that if I trust in him, I'll be made with God, right with God forever and ever and ever. And then, if I've heard anything you just said, Dr. Christ, it would also mean that I'm about to be on a road of affliction. Is that what you're selling me this morning? Yes, it is. If it sounds foolish, that is by God's design. The foolishness of God is greater than man's wisdom. The weakness of God is greater than man's power. I would beg of you to turn to faith in Christ. I would beg of you to do it. For the rest of you, maybe you're on the road of faith and you're trying to finish in a different way than you started. I do not have a Taylor Swift song to inspire you at this moment. Instead, I've chosen a poem by Zach Bryan. 
Now, I don't know much about Zach Bryan. I do have this in common with him. We came from some of the same most God-forsaken geography of the United States of America. Oklahoma and Texas, yes. <laughs> he wrote this poem I've been reflecting on for several weeks now. And, and as I've been reflecting on it, I can't quite, I couldn't quite put my finger on why it resonated with me other than the fact that I think it reminds me of a couple of roads in my own life. Here's what Zach Bryan writes. It's called This Road I Know. He says, there's this flash I get off in a fever dream or a vision of sorts, most times late at night, and I haven't found out why, but I know exactly why. I'm on this road, and I hear gravel underneath me, and I feel it too, and I don't know where I am, but I know exactly where I am. It's dark, it's really dark, and the car is warm, but somehow I can feel how cold the night is. I don't know where the road leads, but I know exactly where it ends. You see, I keep driving, and all I see for the longest while is is my headlights, for an eternity, it seems. And everything is desolate and empty and nothing and, and hopeless. I'm lost, but I know where I'm going. I'm safe, I'm warm, I'm driving, and I, I see this small light a dim one growing bigger and brighter and closer and stronger. And the closer I get, the more I see. I make out a house with lights thrown across it. It's a porch and there's some cars, some frosted windshield that I hadn't been touched for hours. And I I hear a song and it's faint and I can't make out the name, but I know every word. I feel my feet first and it's cold and they're crunching and it's the sound of driveways and the the wind takes my breath away with it. And then I walk up to this door and I knock and even though I don't feel I have to, I don't know where I am, but I know exactly where I am. And this crack of light widens on the porch underneath me as this door opens and this brown haired girl with the brightest smile. I don't know who she is, but I know her so well. And behind her, the warmest home I've ever seen. It's orange and comfortable. There's fire and it's bulb lit. And she says to me, where have you been? We've been waiting on you all night. We've missed you. She says through the kindest smirk I've seen in so long. And then she she tapers off the sentence with a with the peaceful sound that a lady makes and she grabs me on my forearms and she pulls me softly into the dining room and there's people and they're happy and they're content for once. I don't know who they are, but I know exactly who they are. And we're all standing and I'm laughing at a joke I'll never hear again. I don't know where I am, but I know exactly where I am. And then she tucks her head between my collar as a friend, between my collar and my jaw and there's no weight at all. And I don't know where I am, but there's no wait at all. It's laughter and grins and no tomorrow to win. I don't know where I am, but I know exactly where I am. I don't know where I am, but I know exactly where I am. That's faith, friends. That's the road from the beginning to the end. Sometimes you don't know where you are, but you know exactly where you are. Sometimes you don't know where you're going, but you know exactly where you're going. That tension you feel, you see, is the tension of finishing like you started. You start by faith in a crucified and risen Christ. And by God's grace, you and I, (laughs) we're going to finish that way. Amen? We're going to finish that way. Let's pray. Father, as always, thank you that you've not left us as orphans, but you've given us your spirit and your word. Thank you for these students. How wonderful and filled with life they are. I wish I could make them feel what it's going to be like on this road of faith. Many of them probably already have a sense of it. It's a difficult road, Lord Jesus. 
Help us not to end up in some ditch because we've turned the gospel into something that it's not. Just help us, Lord, to, to finish like we started. Take these words and let them be the words that are the words of life. Speak to hearts even in this morning, in, in this moment. Speak as only you can, Lord. Let it be the hearing of faith. Pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Would you guys just stand as we continue to worship? In this next song, let's just continue um, to, to end where we started in faith. Uh, let's just declare our faith as we sing this song and our trust in God. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. He's been my fourth man in the fire time after time. Born of his spirit and washed in his blood. And what he did for me on Calvary is more than enough. Let's sing this out. I trust in God, my Savior, the one. Who will never fail He will never fail Oh, I trust in God My Savior, the one Who will never fail He will never fail submission and all is at rest and I know the author of tomorrow has ordered my steps so this is my story yes it is and this is my song I'm praising Have a faith in you and it will stand. Sing, I sought the Lord. I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered. I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered. I sought the Lord and he heard and he answered. That's why I trust him. That's why I trust him. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. I sought the Lord, and he heard, and he answered. Thank you, God. That's why I trust him. Oh, that's why I 
trust Him, I sought the Lord, and He heard, and He answered. I sought the Lord, and He heard, and He answered. I sought the Lord, and He heard. He always answers. That's why I trust Him. Oh, that's why I trust in God. Oh, my Savior, the one. Trust in God, oh, my Savior, the one who will never fail. He will never fail. One more time, oh, I trust in God, oh, my Savior. Cause he will never fail No, he won't Lord, we thank you that you will never fail You never failed then, you will never fail now And you will never fail in the future And we thank you We thank you for who you are For what you did for us at Calvary, God Lord, we will praise you in faith now and till the end. We will continue to worship you and live out our lives in faith in our risen Savior. We thank you, God, that as we sought you, you heard us and you answered. We thank you that you always will and you will never never ignore us. God, for you love us. You love us so much that you sent your only son to die. And we thank you. We love you and we praise you for who you are. In your holy and precious name, we all say amen. Don't forget the chapel code should be up on the screen.